68 year old gentleman came to ER with complaints of excessive tiredness for last 3 days. Initial 10 second assessment, patient was conscious, oriented and obese command, primary survey, airway, no airway obstruction, and breathing, normal and bilateral equal chest movement with respiratory rate of 20 per minute and oxygen saturation of 99% in room air. Okay. Air, air entry bilaterally equal and no added sounds. Circulation, blood pressure of 140 per seven, by 70 uh, millimeter mercury and pulse rate of 100 per minute. Good peripheral pulses. IV cannulas placed for taking blood samples, sir. And uh, disability wise, uh, GCS 15 by 15, uh, pupil 2.5 millimeter bilateral reactive, exposure temperature A febrile, adjuncts to primary survey ABG was taken, uh, pH was 7.15 and PCO2 is 36.5, PO2 is 31.5 and uh, potassium is 5.3. So, uh, how do you uh, say an ABG? Like what are the things? No, no. What are the values? What is the order in which you usually you say? Uh, pH. Okay, PCO what is the pH? pH is 7.15. 7.15. After that, PCO what do you say text? Yeah. PCO2 36.5. Okay. Then? And uh, PO2 is 31. And mm -hmm. bicarbonate is 12.2. Okay. Then? Uh, anion gap is 15.8. Okay. And uh, sodium is 5.3. And uh, pot, uh, sodium. Uh, Bill sodium. is more louder. Sorry? Bill is more louder. Sodium 132, okay. potassium 5.3, okay. chloride 104. Uh, okay. Any more value which is of relevance? Lactate? Lactate uh, normal, sir. Normal. Okay. So, what's your impression on the ABG? Uh, high metabolic acidosis. Hmm? High anion gap metabolic acidosis. Okay. How did you come to that? So pH was uh, pH and bicarbonate was low. Uh, okay. So what's the next step once you find that? Uh, it's acidosis. Okay. It is acidosis. How will you know it is primary? Which is the which is the primary pathology? Respiratory or metabolic? PCO2 is. Uh, PCO2 is. Thirty six. That is. Uh, nor, uh, normal sir. Okay. So, what will happen to PCO2 in uh, respiratory acidosis? Incre uh, increases. Okay. So, here what should be the uh, uh, PCO2 as per correction? 36. As per correction? Mm -hmm. Alkalos. Al Pardon? Louder? Yeah. What's the Windows formula? So. Okay. So, once you calculate by that, what's the PCO2? You tell the bicarb, no? 12.2. Yeah. And uh, PCO2 is uh, 36.5 and pH is... No, no. Expected PCO2 is what we are going to calculate. Okay. So, expected PCO2 is equal to 1.5 into... Bicarb. What's the bicarb? 12. So, 1.5 into 12 will be 12 plus 6, right? 18. Okay. Plus 8. 18 plus 8 is 26. 26. Plus or minus 2. So, it is 26 plus or minus 2. So, what's the PCO2 here? 36. 36. Right. So, the PCO2 is high. But here it is a VBG, right? VBG. It is a venous blood gas. So, basically again you cannot calculate that. Okay. In an as, uh, arterial blood gas, if the PCO2 was 36, there is going to be another pathology along with that. What is that pathology? Respiratory acidosis. There is a, along with the metabolic acidosis, there will be a respiratory, respiratory acidosis, acidosis also, provided this was a ABG and the PCO2 value is reliable. You understood, no? What if the PCO2 was low? We calculated the PCO2 as 26. What if here uh, in the ABG PCO2 was 14? What will be the second pathology? It will be a respiratory alkalosis. You understood, no? There is a underlying uh, respiratory alkalosis also. Because of that only, this has gone down. Clear? You understood the concepts, no? So, likewise, once you calculate for, there is compensatory formulas for everything. Okay. Once you have a primary pathology with this respiratory, you, cal you calculate the expected bicarbonate. Okay. Once the bicarbonate is higher than the expected value, there is an alkalotic, metabolic alkalotic component also. You understood the concept? Okay. So, here, if it was an ABG, we would have uh, uh, told with certainty that there is a respiratory acidotic component also. 
Okay, as of now, we can take the primary pathology irrespective of metabolic acidosis with a normal lactate. So, it is a metabolic acidosis and you feel it is a HAKMA. Hello? Uh, okay. okay. ECG was taken. ECG heart rate was 104 per minute and sinus rhythm. And secondary survey, 60, 68 year old gentleman came to ER with complaints of excessive tiredness for last 3 days. He was a diabetic for last 10 days and was on insulin. Diabetic for only 10 days? 10 years. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, and, he, and was on insulin with a fairly controlled blood sugar. Okay. He skipped taking insulin for last 2 days. Following okay. which he developed excessive thirst, increased frequency of urination and later excessive tiredness. For these complaints he, came, he was presented to our hospital. No signs of infection of any fever, dysuria, cough or uh, breathlessness. Past history. He is a known history of diabetes mellitus on insulin, no over rapid. And no, uh, no hypertension and uh, no history of tuberculosis or bronchial asthma, coronary artery disease. There is no significant past history relevant for, the, his, for his present complaint. General so, okay, what will be the relevant past histories? By now, we, we know the diagnosis, like a known case of diabetic patient coming with uh, uh, tiredness, fatigue and all, and uh, you have an uh, uh, acidosis in the blood gas. So, most likely the diagnosis, we are reasonably certain by this point. So, what are the relevant histories? What are the precipitating factors, basically? It, anyone of you can answer, it's okay. Most common is the Okay, infection, so here we have... Infection. Yeah. Here we have definitive history of the person missing the skipped dose. Okay, there is a missing of uh, the uh, anti uh, hyperglycemic agent. Okay, In second infection. thing. Infection. Okay, infection. Then sepsis. Infection and sepsis will come together. Then trauma. Any stress at the end of the day can can precipitate. Then UTI. That again infection. No, it will come under the bracket of infection. Pneumonia. Dehydration. Dehydration per se. Dehydration. Okay. Any vomiting, loose stools leading to dehydration again can precipitate. Okay. Then? Pneumonia, pneumothorax, myocardial infraction. No, that again, again, any any stress, you can, we can probably tell all, all kind of diseases. Anything specific? Always think about drugs also. Drugs, alcohol. Okay. There can be drugs which can uh, precipitate a person into decay. There can be other causes of uh, acidosis. Alcoholic. Binge alcoholism can present with uh, acidosis. Okay. So, that is it. Even OHS can, in fact, there are certain group of OHS which can precipitate decay. Okay. So, always think about other causes which can precipitate decay uh, other than the conventional thing, dehydration, drugs, kind of stuff also you need to remember. Okay. Continue. General examination, patient was conscious and oriented, comfortable, mind, uh, mildly dehydrated, no pallor, itra, sinuses and clubbing, lymphatic. So, how did you assess for dehydration? Mildly yeah. dehydrated. Thirst. Hmm? History of thirst. History of thirst. Cannot establish dehydration, no? Uh, urine. Out output us. Skin. Go for capillary refill time, no? That will be one, one thing which you can go for. Skin. Okay. Other. In adults, what else? IVC can be. Exactly. You look at the IVC measurement. Okay. So, look for objective metrics. Okay. History is one thing, but definitely do a proper clinical examination. Look for skin dagger, capillary refill, tongue mucosal kind of uh, wetness. JVP. IVC. Okay. Fine. Pulse rate of 100 per minute and BP, blood pressure of 140 by 70 millimeter mercury and respiratory rate of 20 per minute and oxygen saturation of 99 percentage in room air. Okay. Systemic examination, central nervous system, patient was conscious and oriented, motor and sensor system normal, no signs of meningeal irritation, plantar reflex, bilateral flexor. Uh, respiratory system, normal vesicular breath sound heard, no added sounds. Okay. Cardiovascular system, S1, S2 heard, no uh, tachycardia, uh, gastrointestinal tract, uh, per abdomen was soft, no uh, tenderness, no organomegaly. Uh, oh. Investigations. Uh, yes, GRBS was 140, uh, 490. 490. 490. Okay. And uh, serum ketone was positive. Okay. Hemoglobin was 14.2 and serum creatine was 1.3. Sodium was 130. Potassium was 5.3 and magnesium is 2.2.
calcium is 9.38 okay diagnosis okay so at this point should we be waiting for the regular labs to come before yes. that you could have done something no what are the things so assuming that this patient has come in definitive history of her diabetes was there definitive history of skipping uh, 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 insulin or oj what is it insulin insulin was there then uh, there is also documented acidosis which is uh, more indicative towards sarcoma right so what should have been done at that point uh, normal saline was bolus was given normal saline bolus was given okay how much how was it started one point uh, actually we need to give 6 liter uh, mm -hmm. uh, come here one by one point in 30 minutes and uh, mm -hmm. and one, another one point in uh, next one hour and one point in uh, next two hours mm -hmm. one point after two to uh, next two to four hours mm -hmm. okay what is the logic behind giving uh, normal saline NDK. Louder. So why before insulin, before anything normal saline? Okay. So he's talking about something called as corrected sodium. What is it? How will you correct for sodium? Anyone? Hmm. Okay, so basically we have to correct the sodium. Okay, there is something called a pseudo hyponatremia for elevated glucose. Assuming that our uh, glucose is 500, let us assume for this patient the glucose is 500. Now your lab sodium value is 130. There is a formula in which you have to calculate the corrected sodium. Okay, roughly there is calculator center, but roughly you can remember that for any 100 increase in glucose above 200, you have to add 2. Okay, so 200 we keep as baseline, 300 means you add 2, 400 means you add 4, 500 means you add 6. Okay, if our sodium was 130, the corrected sodium will be 136. Understood? Okay, so there is a different formula also where they say the, the multiplication value is 1.8 until 500 and above uh, 500 then you have a different uh, multiplication factor. Okay, but for practical purpose, 2 is reasonable. That has been uh, kind of widely accepted now. So, if it is 600, what will be the, the uh, glucose is 600, sodium is 130. What will be the corrected sodium? 130. 130. 138. Okay, got it, no? Sure. So, he was talking about the corrected sodium. Why corrected sodium comes into picture is to decide on the correcting fluid. So, if the corrected sodium was like 145, you cannot give normal saline. Understood? No. In those kind of situations, you have to give half an S. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Continue. Just a minute. He was talking about corrected sodium. Okay. So you calculate the corrected sodium then. Uh, again, there are two important things. One is to overcome the insulin resistance. Second thing is that once there is uh, uh, this volume depletion, even if you are giving IV insulin, the, uh, the, the perfusion is not adequate. You have to increase the perfusion. No, there is vasoconstriction. What happens? Dehydration, again vasoconstriction happens. So you have to overcome the insulin resistance and the vasoconstriction. Because of that only, we are giving fluids first. Apart from, there are few more justifications for giving fluid first. Okay. So that's why you start with the IV fluids. Even when you are seeing that uh, sugars is like 700, first step is always correct the volume status. Because without correcting the volume, there is no point in giving insulin because insulin won't uh, have the adequate effect. Okay, okay. Normal saline, you told about the various uh, ways in which you can give the initial bolus high volume fluid. That again has a catch, not in all patients. What will be the group of patients where we are going to be cautious about the initial bolus fluid? Again, patient in CKD or uh, patient who definitely cannot handle such a big volume, no? patient in uh, frank volume overload, definitely we might be very cautious to give a bolus kind of a fluid. Okay. So again, there we have to be patient specific in giving the initial volume. Okay. So that is with the volume. After that, 
second thing if uh, potassium is low means we need to correct potassium in this case uh, potassium is normal so okay potassium low means we have to correct potassium cutoffs of potassium cutoff means like the, till what value till, we will till, correct uh, till 5 5.5 below what value 3.5 to 5 Okay, below what value you won't start insulin? Less than 3.3. Less than 3.3. Yeah. If the potassium is less than 3.3, you have to correct the potassium before starting the insulin infusion. Clear? Yeah. So you are keeping a target of potassium between 4 to 5, ideally. That is the sweet spot where we would we are comfortable in starting on things. What's the problem with insulin and potassium? Potassium reduces the insulin. Insulin is insulin. Okay. So once you give insulin, what is happening to the potassium? Yeah. Okay. So because of that, since the the potassium is going to decrease when you are giving insulin, what does hypoglycemia cause? What are we afraid about such a low potassium? Cardiac issues. Okay. It can lead to further arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, things like that. So that is why we want to keep a normal potassium before giving. A, we are going to give continuous insulin. No. So, because of that, we have to keep the potassium in a normal pitch. Okay. Now, we told that if the potassium is less than 3.3, we won't be starting insulin. We will correct the insulin. For, uh, sorry. We will correct the potassium first, first and then, then only start this. So, how are you going to give potassium? Say the value is 3.3 or 3.4. Uh, 3.2 for easy thing. How will you correct potassium? And first, we put a central line. Mm, no. That means that any hypoglycemia patient, uh, we have to wait for the central line. No? 40, 40 milliliters. Mm. 40 milliequivalents, how? Per kg. No. So 40 milliequivalents in a 100 ml NS, 500 ml NS, mm -hmm. over 4 hours we can. Okay, that is the kind of a traditional kind of method we have been following. No? Here anyway we are giving IV fluids at a faster rate. So always make sure that you supplement the potassium. Your 20 to 40 is what we say for less than 3.3. Okay. So, but there we go for the higher value. So basically, we go by 40 milliequivalents in one hour. Is the maximum you can correct. So, but again, if the fluid is going along with the fluid, you add 40 milliequivalents. Whatever fluid rate is going along with that, you can continue. If it is uh, between like 3.5 to uh, 4.5, or not definitely below 5, again, along with insulin, you are supposed to start on potassium also. There it is again 20 milliequivalents. Okay, that, that's more of like supplemental. So the first thing I told 20, it is not 20, it is 30 to 40. 30 to 40 is what? If it is low, again with the supplemental fluid. Okay, you told about the central line. The problem comes uh, is that if you are if you are needing to what uh, uh, give it in a smaller concentration, like we are not able to give large volume, right? It's a CKD patient. There probably we are we are not very happy to give lot of fluids. In those kind of situations, when the concentration of potassium is going to be high in the IV fluid, that will be the situation where you will need to go for a IV line. In the 500 ml NS, don't worry about IV line, the central line. But if you are going to plan to give it in a 100 ml equivalents, for whatever reason, that's not only in DK, in any other situations, the concentration of potassium is what going to matter, where you might need to go for a central line. Clear so far? So, initial high bolus volume as per patient condition, after that, we are looking at the potassium. We are making sure that the potassium is in a reasonable range before starting on insulin. So, if the potassium is low, we are starting with the potassium correction as per recommendation. After that? Magnesium, we want to see. Mm. Okay. Magnesium, if it is low, then probably yes. But we that is along with the hypokalemia thing. But usually, we don't find a magnesium issue with DK. Okay. Fine. Insulin infusion. Okay. Now, we come to the crux. So, how, how are you going to start on the insulin infusion? 0 0.15 unit. Per, uh, 0 0.15 unit per kg. 0 0.15 unit per, per kg. kg. Bolus uh, Per kg we used to give. Uh, of what? Bolus, infusion. Infusion. For BK, HHS. What is 0 0.15 kg per? Insulin infusion. What insulin? Anybody can be more specific? She's almost there in the ballpark, but not specific. What will be the correct answer? How will you start insulin infusion in DK? Yes. 
what you are starting with what kind of you are starting with the regular insulin and the dose 0 0.1 0 0.1 maximum to 0 0.15 okay right it's usually called as low dose insulin protocol so 0 0.1 unit per kg irrespective of the initial sugar value you start with that so for a 60 kg let us assume that it is 0 0.1 we start with 6 units of regular insulin okay then after one hour what are we going to do what is your target reduction if you know the answer then you will know how how much in one hour how much are we going to reduce 50 to 70 excellent so our aim is to reduce sugars by 50 to 70 in one hour okay so 60 kg person we have started with six units infusion rate of regular insulin uh, the initial value was 500 okay the next value is 520 what are you going to do double the dose okay so usually we follow this doubling our protocol where we will go from 6 to 12 but before that there are certain things you need to look because insulin there are certain IV sets and all which can bind if you have an IV filters and things like that so always make sure that the cannulation and the uh, method of delivery of insulin is proper okay assuming that the delivery is proper then you go for doubling of the insulin okay so next value if you are achieving the target then you continue with the same rate of infusion once it starts coming like in an hour you have a reduction of more than 75 that is when you start tapering got it no okay then again tapering there will be a kind of a protocol if it is decreased by this much we will uh, decrease the insulin dose by this much right as per the protocol you can go fine then in this case we st start uh, stop the infusion when grbs reaches 125 mm. before that anything insulin infusion no no what are the prerequisites to stop insulin infusion serum, serum ketone were negative and uh, grbs uh, less than 220 uh, okay sugar, sugar is not the criteria to stop insulin infusion serum ketone it is the correction of acidosis correction of basically ketones and remember that you cannot go by urine ketones because urine ketones correction is gonna lag by at least 24 to 36 hours because of the method we usually they follow the nitroprusate method and all so basically it will get delayed because as, uh, i mean uh, let us not go into that uh, so basically you can go for the serum ketones or the, a better indicator will be closure of the anion gap because once the ketones is uh, normalized then only your anion gap is closed into close right so one definitive parameter you can go by is the closure of anion gap okay so once the anion gap is closed then that will be the point probably we will be considering the changing of an infusion to a bolus again before that suppose the anion gap is persistently high but your sugar is becoming low say the sugar is 120 what is the recommended way of continuing should we be stopping the insulin infusion or should we be doing anything else so that is a situation where we are going to give dextrose and continue with your insulin infusion okay fine so we will continue to keep the sugar somewhere around around the 200 ballpark and continue with the insulin infusion until you get the correction of anion gap clear okay now assuming that we have a certain period of time where the sugar is normal your anion gap is uh, closed there is no more ketosis okay that is the point i mean that is the point where we are going to stop and convert to a bolus dose now how are you going to do that how will you calculate the dose okay so that is called as total daily requirement okay so you calculate the total dose assuming that we have given in last 24 hours 100 units of insulin okay you are going to give a basal bolus okay 40 to 50 percentage of the total dose so let us say that 100 units now we can give 40 to 50 units as bolus basal clear that when are you going to give at least two to four hours before stopping the infusion and one key thing you need to make sure before stopping is that the patient has started back on oral feeds 
okay then only you are going to succeed in stopping this uh, uh, infusion to bolus so again the patient ready for meals tolerating oral feeds at least half an hour to one hour before the oral feeds uh, next due meals is when you are going to give your insulin okay so you calculate 100 you are going to give 40 or 50 units of uh, basal bolus insulin uh, long acting insulin as a bolus insulin and the remaining 50 percent in three divided doses of rapid acting insulin before meals clear so 100 if you are giving 40, remaining you have 60, 20, 20, 20, you are going to give before meals, long uh, 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 fast acting insulin. So far good? Okay. Right. What is, okay, anything else you want to say? Yes. Yes. Okay, so, so that is the right way of stopping your insulin. Okay. Right. Can there be euglycemic decay? Yes. Hmm? Mm. Okay. So, always remember that the sugars can be normal, but the still the patient can be in decay. Okay. So, remember about such an entity and there again your method of correction is going to remain same. Okay. To prevent hypoglycemia, probably we might end up giving uh, glucose also. Okay. So, there is an entity called as euglycemic uh, decay. The difference between decay and HHS? Uh, blood sugar is... Okay. Because From the management point of view, are we going to make any gross changes between the both? The correction is gradual. More or less, it is going to be the same. Okay, at the end of the day, your treatment approach and everything is going to be the same. Uh, next thing will be any role of bicarb, soda bicarbonate in DK. Okay. So, there is definitely a, a controversy regarding uh, bicarb use, but as you said, six, definitely 6.9, less than 6.9 pH, you, you are justified in giving uh, soda bicarbonate. Okay. Then again, based upon the deficit, you can calculate the dose and give it. Usually, we the bolus, initial bolus is usually 100 milli equivalents. Okay, 100 milli equivalents in uh, uh, free water, I mean distilled water, we give over in um, 400 ml of distilled water, you give it over 4 to 5 hours. That is the usual correction dose if the pH is less, point, less than uh, 6.9. The other condition probably you might consider will be refractory hyperkalemia also. The potassium is remaining high irrespective of your thing, that again with an acidosis, that will again become an indication for uh, soda bicarbonate. Okay. So, uh, uh, for a pH of 7.0 or 7.1, definitely, even if the bicarb is very, very low, 5, 6, 7, 8 and all, we may not consider IV bicarbonate. Okay. Is there a classification for uh, DK, like mild, moderate, severe? There is. Okay. So, there is again a classification based upon the pH and bicarb. If it is less than 7.0, then it will become severe. 7.2-ish to 7 point something. I mean, absolute values you need to uh, verify. But again, mild, moderate, severe. Why this comes into picture is, as per the new guidelines for mild DKA, there is some uh, evidence to say that you can correct with sub-Q itself. Need not go for IV uh, continuous infusion. Okay. So, what falls into a mild DKA, probably in uh, need not admit to ICU, in ward and the close monitoring, you can try attempting correction with a sub-Q incidence also. Okay. Anything else? Mm. So, here definitely uh, there was no other infection or anything. So, usually the other challenge is going to be an underlying infection. Again, probably until you get a good control of the infection, your uh, DK is not going to get corrected. Okay. Any complications like of DK, at least theoretically, if what happens if the patient is going to remain for a longer period of time uncorrected DK? Renal 
that is probably delayed. What is the worrisome uh, deadly complication of DKA is cerebral edema. Okay. So that will be one thing which we need to watch out for. If the patient remains in DKA for a prolonged period of time, there can be raised ICP, cerebral edema kind of features and that is what is going to be fatal for the patient. Okay. So always watch out for that also. Hmm? Okay, I think we have covered reasonably well all precipitating factors. We covered correction of precipitating factors in management of DKA, then how to start insulin, how to stop insulin, what is the importance of fluids, uh, potassium we have kind of covered. I think that's that's it. Anything else? Anybody want, your, want to add? Any doubts? <laughs> Nothing, no? Okay, right. Thank you.